Council member seats are up for grabs on multiple islands this year because incumbents have reached their term limit and cannot run for re-election. On Hawaii Island, two men are challenging each other for the District 8 seat representing North Kona. And on Oahu, three candidates are battling for the Honolulu City Council District 7 seat, which covers areas including Kalihi, Mapunapuna, Salt Lake and Sand Island. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of Election 2020 on Insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. Tonight, our final double header before the primary election. In our first half, we'll hear from the two men running for the District 8 seat in the Hawaii County Council. They'll be followed by three candidates vying for the District 7 seat in the Honolulu City Council. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our candidates appearing via Zoom. The District 8 North Kona seat in Hawaii County Council is open because incumbent Karen Eoff has reached her term limit. Craig Bo Kahui is a UH Manoa graduate and a Navy veteran. He's the founder of the Laiopua 2020 nonprofit organization. Holeka Inaba was born and raised in Kona. He's a graduate of Kamehameha Schools Kapalama and Chapman University and is pursuing a doctorate degree. Let me start with, with you, um, Huleka. Tell us about your district. Tell us about the people who live there, what it's been like to be raised in that area, and, and what do you think is the most special thing about your district? Aloha nui kako. Thank you so much for having me this evening. And uh, this District 8, I would say, is a diverse district. Uh, we oftentimes forget that it extends all the way to our Waikoloa uh, resort community, and it, it includes um, people who sometimes live here part of the year, uh, all the way to our Kama'aina here in Kalawa, Kealakehe, Laiopua area. So it's a pretty diverse district, if you will. And then, um, Bo, you prefer us to call you Bo, by the way. Uh, you're, yeah. you're from the homestead, and how does that play into uh, the lifestyle? What, what, how do you think that appeals to folks who live there? Well, I, I think the uh, growing homestead community here in, in the new urban core in Kailo Kona has really uh, 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 helped, I think, the overall demographics in this community. I think when you look over um, the, the, the range of this particular district, you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, well, like I said, a very diverse diverse demographics. I think bringing the homestead community here, that was uh, a, a result of chapter 14, uh, the settlement uh, and monies and land given to Native Hawaiians to provide housing, I think offered that opportunity for me and my family. That, that um, homestead is, is relatively new, right? It's, it's sort of like a subdivision style homestead, isn't it? That is very correct. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the newest homestead on the Hawaiian Homes Inventory. And it's a 1,200-unit development with up to 300 homes built to date. Uh, we have 163 units being uh, uh, planned for construction uh, um, this year, if not this year, at least in the spring. So we're excited for that. And then... Um, you know, I think I think Native Hawaiians will play a, a pivotal role in our economy here in West Hawaii as we begin to take and participate in the new urban sector. You know, um, uh, Holeka Inaba, you uh, plan to become an educator, or you are probably already partly are an educator. Um, what are the educational challenges in that district? What do you think are the, the concerns folks have about education in that district? Right now, I think it's a concern not just for our district, but it's a it's a statewide concern. Uh, we have parents who need to go back to work, who are going to have to find places for their children to um, be during the school day, whether uh, it's at home or with family. And if not, they are making a decision to send their students back to school. And as we know, the DOB is uh, continuously giving updates and our school level employees are trying their best to prepare schools for a safe return on August 17th. But I think it's 
not specific to our district or to our island, but it's a it's a statewide issue and uh, something that we are we might need to be fluid with in the coming weeks, depending on how the cases of COVID either increase or decrease. You know, speaking of uh, the COVID crisis, I mean, it, how has it impacted your folks' campaign, Bo? I mean. Um, you're a traditional campaign guy. I imagine there were things you wanted to do that you just couldn't. So how did you have to adjust to this uh, this environment? I think this, that was the biggest challenge for any candidate going into uh, this election. Um, you know, canvassing was near impossible. In fact, we ruled that out right away uh, uh, because of the dangers that and the, the effects that it might have uh, reaching out. Uh, to our district, uh, uh, we we decided to do a more um, public campaign through, uh, you know, the website, the web, uh, through the media, and and newspapers, and and you know, again, not everybody reads the newspaper, not everybody listens to the radio station, so it, it's been a real challenge for any candidate. Uh, to uh, successfully run a campaign that would, would lead uh, uh, to a successful outcome. You know, Holeka Inaba, as well as you as a newcomer, um, getting your name out is a key to having a successful campaign. How difficult was that when people are, one, hard to reach, and two, probably not paying that much attention to uh, politics? I think this year we were lucky, you know, with with COVID upon us, not lucky for COVID, but people are tuned into social media and they're looking for information. So if you're there and can um, meet them where they already are, you can get your message out. You can get um, who you are out to your community. And um, to build on that, I'm thankful to have my family. I've been generations here in Kona, um, business owners on both my mother and my father's side. And um, thankful for my kupuna who passed down our name and gave us our kuleana and our place here in Kona. It's interesting. So you're saying that one of the tricks of your social media was actually to provide information as opposed to, here I am, here's why you should elect me. Is it that different kind of messaging? Yeah, sharing some stuff about COVID, but sharing about myself as well. And uh, maybe non-traditional in the sense that it's not always talking about issues or um, yeah, current issues, having some fun things like Mele Mondays where you can play some Mele Hawaii for our community, you know, just to um, give us a break from everything that's going on. So that was kind of a fun approach to take this year via social media. You know, um, let me move on to some of the, the common concerns of the Big Island and also other uh, neighboring islands. I shouldn't say neighboring islands. I know I'm not supposed to say it that way because you guys are just as important as us, but Anyway, uh, you know, Governor Ige today uh, announced they're reinstating the um, quarantine. So people who, uh, you know, fly into um, the neighbor islands are going to be quarantined again. I'm wondering, do you folks, I'll start with you, Bo, do you support him doing that? Um, and do you think most of the people in your district also support this quarantine when, when on the Big Island you have so few cases? We do. Uh, I especially support the what, what is it, the partial quarantine? And he, he coined it as partial. So neighbor islands may uh, travel to neighbor islands without going to Oahu, and Oahu uh, restricted um, uh, for, the, for the Big Island, and maybe selfishly, uh, we, we want to protect our community. And I think it's important that we put into place policies that are going to protect our communities from the rising, rising COVID uh, infection on Oahu. So I have family on Oahu. I, I, we had plans to go there. I have plans to go there next week to help my son, um, who lives in Waimanalo on the homestead. But um, that's pretty much out the door. And thinking about reaching out to my daughter, who's purchasing a home in Santa Barbara, it makes it difficult now for us to make that travel as California uh, is it's just severe. Uh, so um, how we set these policies on a county level to ensure that we can get the state and the governor in place, what we believe is in the best interest of our county 
I think, has to be mandated. Um, Holeka, on that issue, do you agree about the quarantine being a good thing? And, and number two, though, are you concerned about the economy? What, what's going to be happening with the Big Island economy? I think there were businesses that were hoping to see some business come from Oahu. Well, first of all, I do support the quarantine being uh, reinstated. I think it's, it's our kuleana as a community, not just as this island, but as a statewide community uh, to take this seriously. And obviously we see the cases keep rising. So I'm thankful that our state leadership has made the call to protect our community members. And we know that some businesses here um, were seeing some increased business uh, as a result of inter-island travel being open again recently. Uh, but it comes down to, again, we just need to protect our community. And uh, we know that the economy, not just in Hawaii County, but across the state, is hurting as a result of uh, general tourism being decreased. But it's, uh, it's our challenge in the rest of these months for the current council members and for us in the next year uh, to figure out and map out where our community and where our county needs to head to ensure um, success and, um, you know, a bright future for our residents. Uh, Boka Hui, what are your concerns about the economic impacts of all this? Well, you know, it's it's really going to, you know, with, with COVID virus, obviously, it, uh, it's really happened. Uh, uh, it's really put uh, a real uh, stop to our economy. I really believe in diversifying our economy, and uh, and not to not to uh, let go of tourism, but find a way to employ other sectors of our economy and improve on those sectors, such as agriculture, aquaculture, um, renewable energy. Uh, we we have real uh, deep issues in Kona specifically with our wastewater treatment plant, um, the need for more um, recreational areas. Um, so, uh, uh, and then of course, renewable energy is, is, is something that uh, uh, working on. And then I believe that if we can uh, work towards the 2045 goal for Hawaii renewable, 100% renewable, then I believe we would tackle some of the means by which we can survive through this economy. Uh, Holeka, I'd like you to answer also. Where, where do you see the opportunities? The Big Island it does have a relatively diverse economy compared to some of the other folks, but where do you see the opportunities for a new economy? One of my biggest areas that I want to focus on is one of my top three priorities is agriculture. And um, not only is agriculture going to provide us jobs, but it's going to make sure that we are self-sustainable in terms of providing food for ourselves. Um, so at the county level, we have a lot of power to help our businesses and our people in this area, whether it be um, providing land to a uh, county land to small farmers, helping to better market the products that they produce um, in terms of us as private residents finding ways to incentivize and even um, just give our residents, put on them the kuleana of growing some, some of their own food at home. So it's not just what the county is going to do, but it's what are we going to do um, as residents as well. So uh, in terms of business incubators that can help to support either new businesses to figure out a business plan or to help existing small businesses to grow um, their market is all within the scope of what the county can do and what I think we really need to do right now. You know, I, I did uh, get a question from a viewer um, about the other 500 pound gorilla on the Big Island. Um, are any of the candidates going to be strong enough to take on TMT? And I'd also like you to get into a little bit of, you know, whether you think that that to where you stand on that position and whether you think that was something that might have actually damaged that debate may have been something that actually damaged the prospects for economic uh, diversity on, on the Big Island. Bo, I'll go start with you. Uh, uh, 
You know, this, this particular TMT issue has divided our community and uh, divided our community so much so that I've decided to support both sides of this particular issue. Um, I, I support the cultural practitioners and all of the issues related to TMT as it relates to uh, our culture and native ones. And then I support TMT because Michael Pona said, well, we need new ways to find um, uh, balance in education and bringing that new technology forward and using this platform, uh, uh, not, not my election platform, but using TMT and, sh and, and looking that in a very different light. So I'm, I'm conflicted. Um, oftentimes I've, I've been asked this question many times. I think the parties need to get together. I think the people can only make that decision. I don't think government um, can, can um, 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 hold, hold this thing together. It's really going to take, um, you know, some concession on all, all parties to make things happen. But do you think there's a potential for, for reaching some kind of a, an agreement? I believe there's always a, a, a potential for, for concession. I believe there's a potential for, for us to get to uh, uh, the next level, get to the next plateau for us to solve, I think, both our economic issues related to a billion dollar project, as well as to look and figure out how that's an interface of integrate with our cultural practices. Uh, Holeka, Inaba, I'd like you to explore the same questions. Um, like like Bo said, the TMT issue has um, put a big divide in our community. But as uh, a candidate, I feel it really important that we take a stand. And uh, during the TMT uh, blockade last year, I was there with my Kanaka Hawaii cooking meals, um, and I support the Kia'i the protectors of Mauna Kea. I don't necessarily see it as a huge loss economically for our island. Um, and although the project has contributed millions to our schools, um, just as valuable as those millions are the Aina-based programs that are throughout our community here in Kona and across Hawaii Island. And I think those um, those community nonprofits like Kui Mau and Pa'awilo, um, the Queen's program here in Kona, those are the programs that we need to feed our kids into to support their development and their academics here. Okay, um, another couple questions that come out somewhat of the, of the COVID crisis. Uh, Mayor Kim has said that he doesn't think that tourists will be able to return to the island on September 1st. I think that that kind of goes without saying right now, since everybody's going to be quarantined. Uh, I don't think they're going to lift that quarantine uh, until at least September 5th, according to the governor's orders, although we don't have that for sure. That probably is not going to happen. But the return of tourists and this other idea that would really affect your guys' district is this idea of a resort bubble where you would have sort of a safe zone for, for, for visitors. They could come and stay in Waikoloa or one of the self-contained resorts. Um, uh, Huleka, what do you think of tourism uh, moving forward? Do you, do you think that uh, um, it's something that can happen uh, with some rapidity or is this, this going to be a really long haul? I don't think it's out of the question, but we have to realize you can create a bubble, but employees live outside of that bubble. And employees will come home to their families and we need to protect our families here. And I come from a mentality and a perspective where we malama our residents and our local people. Um, so for me, that is a priority. And if we can't ensure that, then I wouldn't be able to support this idea of a resort bubble here on the Kohala Coast. Okay, um, Bo uh, Kahui, what, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, I think I would echo uh, Oleka's uh, uh, um, concern. And, um, but um, the, the, um, the issue of opening up the tourism economy and bringing tourism back uh, in the next several weeks, for me, has, has to be tempered with what, what our infrastructure can be. 
people up to. We don't have as many hospitals or medical facilities that Oahu has. We don't have as many respirators and beds that we have. So we really have to do and take a really closer look at whether or not we can deal with the rising COVID crisis if it ever reaches our shores and, and, and look at that infrastructure if we'll be able to manage that in a positive way. You, um, you know, I, just, what you just said, something occurred to me is that it's very likely that the students won't be able to return to school for for a while as well and I'm wondering how that in your in your very rural district uh, with in many cases limited uh, connectivity and so on how has that been affecting the, the kids in your district and what are your concerns about you know do you think that perhaps schools on the on the islands where there are very few cases should be able to open up to in-person learning as opposed to Honolulu where You've got so many cases that a lot of people are quite fearful about it. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think that perhaps schools on your island could open to in-person learning? Do you think that that would be both better for the kids and also um, better for the island in general? Uh, uh, Holeka, why don't you start on that? For me, I think it's a fine balance. Obviously, we have the option to stay at home and do distance learning or to go back to school. Right now, our numbers are low. If we're sending 50 kids on a school bus, we're, we're putting them in a can to share this virus if someone does have it. So I think um, we need to come up with a better plan. The DOE needs to come up with um, a plan on how we're going to best serve our students. Because we know that our elementary students don't necessarily learn the best via Zoom. Um, but what are we going to do? We do we do need to protect their health as well. So um, I'm trusting in the leaders of the Department of Education to make the right call. We know that school is supposed to resume today. It's pushed back to August 17th right now. Um, but we know that the county of Hawaii at least uh, has some funds for uh, technology electronics to hopefully support the education of our students in Hawaii County if they do need to be at home. So allocating out those funds properly to ensure that we can um, continue distance learning across our island, I think is very important. Uh, Bo Kahui, what are your thoughts about that? Do you feel like uh, the students have really been harmed by this period of time without being able to be in school, particularly in your area where the schools are really hubs in the community as well? You know, our families and our kupuna were resourceful, really resourceful. And I think, I think we've got to go back really to our communities and employ uh, the resources within our communities and within the schools to look at a solution that can harness both on-campus education and broadband and um, internet um, connectivity. I, I think that's a big challenge we have here on the Big Island. Our bad service is not all over the Hawaii Island. I think the most rural areas like Kau or Kauai Hai, uh, Kohala, those are difficult areas that are gonna, gonna have more even more difficult challenges when they're faced with trying to restart their schools because of their lack of connectivity. I think uh, the, the county would be uh, um, I think prudent to look at its its policies and then do broadband activity, broadband service okay. across Hawaii Island to make that work. Thanks very much, both of our guests, Craig Bo Kahui and Holeka Inaba. We'll return with the candidates for the District 7 seat in the Honolulu City Council. In the meantime, please enjoy this Hikino story from students at Farrington High School. In 2016, dreams of a better life for her family led Florida Lisa Corpus to move from the Philippines to the paradise we call Hawaii. To her surprise, Honolulu is the country's third most expensive city to live in. Therefore, Lisa took up three jobs to support her children. She works as a caregiver and has jobs at two different restaurants. Being at three jobs is not easy for me. But I try my best, and I do for this 
for the future of my children. To Florida Lisa's son, Benedict, the time she spends at work takes away from time that can be spent as a family. To me, balancing your work and your family life is very important. Although I may not have my own family, but I experience my mom not having enough time with me and my sister more because she focused on her job. We had a compromise where she mentioned that she won't stop. She won't stop working three jobs up until I get educated and my sister. Although Florida Lisa cannot change her work circumstances, she understands the effect it has on her children. Like many families in Hawaii, the Corpus family has found that living in paradise comes at a costly expense. Florida Lisa is determined to meet this cost and has made clear that the success of her children is priceless. This is Marcy Palileo from Farrington High School for Hiki no. Welcome back. Honolulu City Council member Joy Manahan has reached his term limit, so three candidates are running for the District 7 seat, which includes Kalihi, Maputapuna, Salt Lake, Foster Village, and Sand Island. Jacob Aki is a graduate of Kamehameha Schools, UH Manoa, and George Washington University. He's the chief of staff for State Senator Kalani English, lives in Kapalaba, and is on the Kalihi Palama Neighborhood Board. Radiant Cordero grew up in Kalihi Kai community. She's a graduate of Mid Pacific Institute and UH Manoa. She's currently the chief of staff of Honolulu City Council member Joy Manahan. And Ryan Mondado was born and raised in Kalihi. He graduated from Farrington High School, UH Manoa, and Johns Hopkins University. The educator is a former chairman of the Kalihi Palama Neighborhood Board. And let me just throw this out. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Radiant Cordero. You know, we've recently at Hawaiian Down done a number of stories about the struggles of the Pacific Islander community in, in Kalihi. Um, what is happening in this district when it comes to COVID? How big of an issue is it? And how has it affected your ability to campaign for this office? Certainly, you know, COVID took all of us on a tailspin. And especially as first time candidates, so we really had to get creative on how we would campaign. But I really, my whole campaign was all about, and my whole goal really, was to really support the needs of our community. And so we were able to mobilize. And a lot of the, I wouldn't want to say issues, but a lot of the circumstances are that we have multi-generational homes a lot. and. I myself lived in multi-generational homes for a majority of my life, and we need to continue to so support them. And city, the city can do that through many ways, um, through, our, through partnerships with our community uh, health centers and more. You know, um, Ryan Mondado, what is special about this district? You know, when we talk about the difficulties of campaigning and the, the way the families are structured, it's really different than a lot of places, right? How would you describe that difference? You know, I would say our district is very resilient in that one of the main reasons for why I'm running for office is because a lot of the people in our district can't vote. We have COFA migrants, we have newly immigra um, immigrated families here, and majority of these people are looking for leaders to represent them. And so one of the largest unique things about this district is we have Kalihi, we have Salt Lake, multi-generational homes, working families who are working every day and really connect to kind of the lived experiences that I had, um, born and raised, low income in Kalihi. Um, so I would say resilience, uh, diverse, and very unique to the overall context of Oahu. Uh, Jacob Aki, similar story for you, also uh, uh, difficult circumstances growing up and so that helps you relate to your constituents here? Definitely, you know, I think when you look at a lot, a lot of the 
issues that our families are going through right now. It's issues of unemployment. It's issues of needing food. And for me, these are things that, these are challenges that I grew up with. Um, fortunately, it was challenges that I overcame. But I think as I spent the past 15 months going door to door, these are issues that our families are still dealing with every day. Um, so I really think part of what we need, not just at the city council, but what we need across government is responsive leadership. We need leaders who understand the struggles that our families are going through, who understand the urgency um, and really work to get things done. Um, COVID-19 has definitely highlighted a lot of our faults, but we definitely need to work harder to provide for our families, many of which in our district are of the vulnerable populations. Radiant, uh, you worked for the councilman from the district, so I won't put this to you too directly, but do you agree that um, there's been a disconnect between the needs of your district and the actual actions of the city or state government? There's always opportunities, and especially as we come out of this pandemic and as we uh, assist a lot of our neighbors through the economic downturn. And as we have seen, um, a lot of our government has begun to get creative, especially how we outreach to our neighbors. So once again, this is an opportunity, and like all of us have gotten creative for it with our campaigns, I know that I will utilize our office resources to make sure that we aptly reach out to our neighbors through the many different ways and meet them at their abilities, capabilities, and availabilities as well. So let me, let me ask all, all three of you, do you feel generally that Kali, that, that your district has, has gotten what it's been entitled to, has been treated fairly by city government? Uh, let me start with you, uh, Ryan Mandato. You know, my answer is a hard no. And that's one of the main reasons for I'm running. You know, I am a public school graduate. I work in public schools. It's time to elect a leader who represents uh, the majority of the community in our district. You know, my house, uh, when I lived on Kalani Street, there was a man shot twice in the head uh, because of an illegal gambling room. And in that moment, uh, no leader came out and addressed this specific trauma that some of the people on our street experience. And we need a leader out there who's going to advocate for the traumatic events that constantly happen in Kalihi. Growing up, I saw it a lot, and there was no leader out there to really advocate and say, this is enough, and I hope to be that leader for my district. How about you? Do you feel like uh, the district's been um, well represented? I, I, I don't mean to bang on uh, Joy Manahan generally, but just in terms of city services and so on, has, has Kalihi tended to get its fair share? You know, I think a lot of the issues that our residents have been facing aren't new. Uh, they've been facing uh, issues like poor roads, poor community infrastructure. And these aren't issues that just happened during Council Member Monahan's term, but it's issues that have been plaguing our uh, district for decades. Um, so I think, you know, over time, uh, a lot of the resources, I think, uh, you know, haven't been coming to our district. But for me, as uh, someone running for this council seat, one of my main goals is to make sure that the allocation of resources are fair and that the uh, residents of our district who have been suffering from issues for decades get the type of services that they need. You know, uh, there's a lot of services that get put in Kalihi for people who may not be from, I, I keep saying Kalihi, but the district is bigger than yes. just Kalihi. Yes. I, I, I should say so, but uh, we're getting a number of questions, more than often for one of these. Regarding the new triage center in Kalihi, what measures will you take to keep the community safe, especially since the community wasn't part of the conversation and were lied to? I don't know what that means exactly, but you know, Ryan, uh, go ahead. You yeah, you know, I think this is a question that we all talked about prior to this, is that I think we all recognize that no matter where you put these services, there's always going to be some sort of nimbyism, not in my backyard. But when you look at our district, many of these issues are already there. Homelessness, uh, mental illness, uh, people are suffering every day in our community. Um, so I think that to an extent, although it may cause some sort of problems that, you know, we should be dealing with it. Um, I do think, though, that there needs to be a lot more community consultation. I think that there needs to be more efforts of reaching out to our communities to share plans. I think oftentimes when the community finds out about projects like this, it's often at the 12th hour, you know, so we really need to start reaching out first um, and to get the community feedback. Um, and I think that's something that we all 
agree on is that there needs to be more conversations with the community. And I think we've all made a made it a goal to make sure that we facilitate these conversations moving forward. And you give Verdi a chance to respond. Yes, and I believe that we have seen how impactful it is when we do include our neighbors, including especially our youth and our kupuna who reach out and not reach out, but um, experience and live their everyday lives on on that lane. And so um, really working with uh, making sure that they are a key community stakeholder and making sure that yes, their voices are heard and that we engage their community at the very beginning, exactly um, at the very beginning. And I believe that um, all of us have run on community driven solutions. And I feel that um, knowing and fostering the relationships with our community early on and making the residents our top priority. Do you find it though, and, and because you did work for uh, the councilman, that you have a problem, as, as uh, Jacob was saying, that needs a solution. Mm -hmm. you, you try and solve it and then people get all mad at you. I mean, the urgency of getting something built was important, right? I mean, how do you feel about people who are, are questioning whether the community is safe with a facility like that there? I believe that it was key to get, I mean, I was very, I was able to spearhead the community uh, forums and community meetings that we held um, with our neighbors there. Um, I was very fortunate to not just have the um, the applicants or the, uh, or the organization, but also the area legislators to come out and hear the neighbors. And the neighbors really just want to be heard and have us experience because they are the ones that live their everyday lives there. And if we just take a step into their shoes, we can really understand that, yes, they do have issues that um, can be addressed in by educating, but there are other issues that we really have to just experience for ourselves together. Can, can, I, add on, can I add on to oh, that? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so I was out there with the neighbors in regards to, quote unquote, protesting the specific project. And I think the largest issue is that you have organizations like IHS telling um, uh, residents that uh, it's a good for the community, but they can't guarantee safety. So that was the largest issue that came up. Um, another issue that came up is that the residents gathered together and said they didn't support it, had a petition to present to the organization. And the organization was saying that uh, there was 100% overwhelming support. And so the issue with these organizations trying to build into communities like Kalihi is that they don't take into consideration uh, the power of agency from community members to say they don't want a project on there and figuring out um, what is the community solution on getting that input and um, addressing those needs. Let and me so. move on to another issue because I've got two questions from viewers that I want to uh, respect. Uh, transportation, um, Decisions have a significant, diverse equity impact with the rail coming through District 7. What solutions do you have to ensure that residents in your district can remain living in the community and thrive? There's a great fear of gentrification around these rail stations, as I understand it. And also, um, yeah, actually, it's the same question twice from one person, sorry. Two, two different names, one same question. Well, I won't be suspicious about that. Um, Ryan, let me start with you on that. How, how do you see rail fitting in the development around rail? I mean, it's going to be transformative, at least for parts of this community. It's definitely going to be transformative. I'm 100% in support of rail, only because I believe public transportation is a social justice issue. Majority of the people in our district use public transportation. One thing that I want to make clear is in regards to development, that we need to keep Kalihi Kalihi and not Kaka'ako. Um, and the way we're going to do that is by really following up through with the, uh, the TOD plan that was put out um, and get Kalihi residents to really um, give input on the specific businesses and social services that could you know, thrive in particular rail stations. And so we really need to be committed to that plan. We really need to be committed to community voice and input. J Jacob uh, Aki, the, you know, the, the, I've seen that transit-oriented development plan for, for Kapalama. And there's a lot of big buildings in there, and uh, both market and affordable units. Do you agree that that plan is something that 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 you can support, the community can support? It is, you know, and I think we need to always look at um, first and foremost when we're going to be developing along these rail station that there's real access to affordable housing that is affordable for local people. I really applaud the 
Kamehameha Schools and their Kapala Makai project for coming out so early. I think what they did was that they took the time to engage with a number of stakeholders, including the neighborhood board, including local officials, but more importantly, many of their leases who currently lease land in that area and trying to find a way how they can uh, incorporate into these new plans. Um, but as I said earlier, I think part of this is uh, goes to what Ryan said is that not only is rail a great tra uh, transportation opportunity uh, because many people in our district use it, but there's a real opportunity to address affordable housing. And I think that a lot of the development that goes on in the district needs to be focused on that, is that many people need need homes. Uh, we have large multi-generational homes. And I think that to alleviate a lot of uh, the other issues relating to that is that we need to get these folks into homes that are uh, affordable. And I'm going to be a really big advocate for that on the council. You're really also, I'd, I'd be interested to hear what you say about that. But it, it's interesting, you mentioned being part of multi-generational homes basically your whole <laughs> life. And, and this idea that, do you think that the affordable homes or units that are generated out of the rail redevelopment could actually do what uh, Jacob is suggesting, that you could actually have units inexpensive enough so you don't have as many multi generate you don't need three or four incomes to afford one of them? That's an interesting question because when you're coming, when you're being welcomed to your new home here in Hawaii, to our island, to Kalihi especially, and um, Makalapa, and Salt Lake, and Alimanu, you know, a lot of the times, multi-generational homes is what you are used to, and, and we have to respect that as well. And with that, I think it's really playing to the fact that allowing to update our zoning, mm -hmm to update and increase our density. So there are affordable housing options for many of our neighbors. I, like you mentioned, um, like I mentioned earlier, lived in multi-generational home in Kalihi. And because of that, as as prices got raised up, you know, was unable to live there anymore. And now, you know, I, I love living in Salt Lake Moanalua, always will call Kalihi home, but that is the case for so many, many of our neighbors. And so really prioritizing that, and that's how we can do that through um, the opportunities of transit-oriented development, where I feel like I really put my heart and soul into our district's transit-oriented development plans, and I will continue to um, support that, work on that, and not just with the office, but with our whole community, with all of us here. You know, you bring up a really interesting point in that the, you know, for many, for many folks, particularly uh, recent migrants or immigrants, the idea of living together was was taken for granted. This is how we're going to do this. This is how we're going to accomplish this. We did this in our prior generations in our other homes, and we're going to do it here. But you know, a lot of the times, the affordable housing projects are small little units for small numbers of people, not mm -hmm. big units for multiple people. But what I'm, I'm thinking though too is, right now in this COVID crisis, people often talk about how the migrant community lives many generations and many people in relatively small you know, living quarters. Um, do you think that people are looking down? How do you feel about the way immigrants and migrants are treated in this community? L let me start with you, uh, Ryan, on that. Do you feel like there is too much stigma being directed at these at the newcomers? Definitely, we need to look at the stigmas that um, you know our Kofa migrants are experiencing in our community. We look at the over-policing that's happening in Kalihi. Majority of the people that were arrested due to the you know, quarantine session were uh, Micronesian and other Pacific Islanders. And in addition to the cultural aspect of living together, I don't think Oahu has a housing issue. I think we have a rent issue. And that the reason why so many people are living in multi-generational homes is because you can have a single family that cannot afford to live in a home alone. And I have experience as someone who was born and raised in low, um, low income. I currently live in, you know, a, a multi-generational home. So these are huge issues that our Asian American and Pacific Islander communities are facing in District 7. How do you, uh, Jacob, how do you, how do you change that mindset outside the district? I mean, how do you... How do you project that out so people can change their thinking? You know, I think part of it is one of the issues that we've had with our recent migrant populations is really a cultural misunderstanding. You know, as someone who's done work across the across the uh, region, I've traveled to places like 
the Marshall Islands and the Federated States of Micronesia. And I continue to have conversations with their leaders here on how we can better educate them uh, and provide them with the necessary information so that they are following the rules here. Um, part of it is a language barrier. I think, you know, one of the ways that we can reach out to those populations is to work with their local consulates here. You know, in the work that I've done with Senator English, we work very closely with the uh, consulates of the RMI and the FSM, and we're constantly passing policies onto them and putting it in a way that's easy for their uh, residents to understand you know but this type of plantation mentality it isn't new prior to the Kofa migrants it was the Samoans it was the Filipinos it was the native Hawaiians it was the Portuguese but I think what we need to realize is that COVID we're all in the same boat and that I think in order to move our communities forward we need to uplift our most vulnerable populations. Go ahead. And speaking of vulnerable populations and communities, um, we have the opportunity to support the increase in affordable housing because if we don't plan and support um, our those in need, it will only exacerbate the affordable housing problem. I just wanted to add to yep. that. Yeah, there's an uh, interesting question from a um, from a viewer, uh, and this is all over the island. This is a problem. You know, cars from newer multi-unit dwellings are making street parking difficult. <laughs> No kidding. I mean, you guys have areas in the district where they literally had to exclude outsiders from parking there, right? Yeah, you know, especially in our district, that's a major issue. And as I've gone door to door in the Salt Lake, Aliamanu, Foster Village area, this is one of the top concerns that I've been getting at, at the door is that residents often have to park 100, 200 yards away from their home. But, you know, I think when, when we look at it, it goes back to a housing issue is that you have so many people living in one home um, and each family has three or four cars. You know, I've counted homes where they've had 12 cars. So I think part of it is um, a housing issue, but I also think that we really need to change uh, the way we think. And I think with rail, there's a opportunity there um, to really change our transportation habits. Uh, it's a tough issue. I think it's an issue that our district has, be, has been dealing with for a long time. Um, but I really think it's something that residents are wanting to find a solution now. You know, I'm curious, and I'll, I'll ask all of you to weigh in on this. We, we did a series of interviews with the mayor candidates, and one of them, uh, uh, Keith Amamiya, said he favored the idea of having uh, basically graduated re re registration costs. So your first car is a reasonable price. Your second car is at the same address is maybe double that the third car is triple that the fourth car is quadruple that do you think placing economic um disincentives on automobiles is something that would would work or and what do you think would work you know i think you know what uh council member monahan um and the city council has explored and and, and i think it's something that we need to continue to uh, look at is these uh restricted parking zones you know although it's something that a lot of residents may not want we have to find something and i think uh sticking with the status quo is uh isn't going to work radian what do you think about that one well, of course, I support restricted parking zones. I've worked very closely with our Kalihi Valley communities, as well as now working with our Makalapa communities to implement this. And that is another example of really engaging our communities to not only build relationships with their neighbors and reclaim their community, but to also make sure that they can see um, what has exacerbated, uh, exacerbated the problem. Let me ask, we do, uh, oh, sorry, okay, let me interrupt, ahead. but I just, you know, in terms of a concrete solution here, these restricted parking areas, do they essentially incentivize people who, who live there to buy more cars? And is that not a good thing? I do not believe it incentivizes um, people to buy more cars. However, it also looks at the trans transportation systems and how we view vehicles and how people get around. And also it looks at the outside traffic factors. Um, you know, a key part of restricted parking zones is are there out, outside factors that add to their um, parking issues, mm -hmm. um, whether it be um, like the Aloha Stadium, for example, or other just other traffic areas. So um, no, it doesn't. But the key point is making sure that we provide um, I guess adequate bus services. Um, we can, you know, moving from Kalihi to Salt Lake, having 
like a robust bus service to having just two uh, two bus lanes that I have to rely on. Um, anyway, so, so let yeah. me ask. I, uh, go, go ahead, ahead. Uh, Ryan. I yeah, I was just going to add. I think we need uh, more radical solutions in regards to addressing parking and streets. Like when you know talking to residents at Salt Lake, when you ask them what's one of the largest issues that you experience, and it's parking. That's kind of concerning to me as someone who is trying to be a leader for the community. Um, thinking about what Radiant said in regards to ensuring that there are multiple access points for public transportation transportation so that working families can get to work but also if we really look at the complete streets project and think about how we can uh, talk about complete streets with adequate street parking um, the only um, issues with that is that we might have to lessen the road roads or make them smaller and so those are the kind of radical changes that we need to think and mindset shifts when we're talking about transportation you know um, you, I don't think I don't think any of you is 30 yet right Oh, I'm 30. 30? <laughs> You're the I'm 25. Okay. 27. But I mean, so <laughs> the, this concept of climate change, global warming, when you talk about transportation, those things are yeah. completely linked together. Mm -hmm. um, Radiant, what, what, what do you think are the most important things that the city can do to deal with climate change, global warming, um, pollution, and that sort of thing? What would you like to focus on? Well, I know that a lot of the focus, even on Insight, has been like the flooding that has occurred. And so this district really has a lot to lose from the impacts of our climate change. And that is like, you know, Mapuna Puna is going underwater and neighbors are so afraid um, during heavy rains that streams will flood. Well, that is why we have to really put our money where our mouth is and um, budget allocate for dredging and cleaning our streams as well as making sure that we take care of our roads, use sustainable, um, carbon neutral, and um, environmental friendly materials for our roads and more. Like I can go on and on about that. However, um, we can also engage our communities to um, just like two weeks ago, our Richard Lane community uh, hooied together and uh, cleaned up Kalihi Stream before um, you know the hurricane was was set to hit, and so taking all of that together to then um, implement to to then implement um, policies that will uh, support our communities who are hit first, hit hardest and worst, which is a lot of our communities here. Uh, Jacob, I'd like you to weigh in on that. Do you think that uh, there's more that an entity like the city council can do? not just for preventing damage within the district, but also influence? Yeah, you know, definitely. I think what the city council can do and what the city can do is really look at when we're approving uh, new development projects is not just looking at uh, the environment currently, but what is the what is it going to look like in 10, 15 years? What is it going to look like when sea level rise comes? Because here in Hawaii, the debate on climate change is over. Sea level rise is happening. So we have to look forward. You know, projects that may be developed on the coastlines you know maybe we you know we have to really look at those things uh because in in the next 10 to 15 years what may be shoreline isn't going to be shoreline anymore so i think our policies uh have reflected that but i think it's conversations that we need to continue having and start to also identify key infrastructure which in our district includes the harbors the airport um, and other areas of where we might need to start looking at planned retreat down the line okay right let me add a little bit to that question in that, again, in addition to mitigating, there's also, also been a lot of time spent at the city council talking about plastic bans and bag bans and, and other things to mitigate the overall world impact of global warming. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about balancing that out? Like, I got to fix my district, but I also want to be a leader in the world of, you know, uh, carbon neutral. You know, climate change is a leading issue. And for leaders in our district in particular, we need to look at how climate change disproportionately impacts low-income communities. There are a lot of streets in Kalihi who don't even have access to recycling. So when you're looking at groups and populations of people who don't have access to those opportunities, those are policy issues that really radically need to be changed at this moment because people who live in these communities need access um, to recycling, need access to sustainable development. And so, you know, my hope is to create those equitable policies so low-income people don't look at sustainability as a quote-unquote rich issue. Sustainability is a practice and it's a lifestyle. You know, I've only got about, okay, really short, because I've got to Okay, finish. but that is also, an, it is also an opportunity towards a just transition towards a green economy that we can also support well-paying jobs that will also support our economy and our environment. 
short for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I've got one minute left, and I'd like each of you to give me one sentence to just answer the question is, why should you be the person elected from this district? And I just like one sentence, uh, Jacob Aki. I, th I think for me, this is the community that my family has been living uh, in for over five generations. And I've had the opportunity to work at all levels of government, from the neighborhood board to the Hawaii State Senate and to the United Nations. And I think in these That's unprecedented right. times, <laughs> right. you know, I'm a school teacher and a school leader and the only person in this race who graduated from public schools and worked in public schools. And it's time for us to elect a leader for Kalihi and District 7 who really can relate to the people that live there. OK, and uh, last sentence. I am ready to hit the ground running to continue the uh, to build the foster the foster relationships that I've had to continue serving our district. Okay, thanks very much. Mahalo to all of the three of you for joining us tonight. We thank the candidates for Honolulu City Council District 7, Jacob Aki and Ryan Mandado and Radiant Cordero. One of them does if one of them does not get the majority of votes in the primary on Saturday, the top two will move on to the general election. Next week on Insights, we'll break down the results of Hawaii's first mail-in primary election. Please join us then. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.